Um, Jeff, are we are live. We are live. <clears throat> Welcome to Warren. Welcome to Warren Briefing. I'm Mary Ann Scally, president of the Belmont League of Women Voters. We're happy to co-sponsor this program with the Warren Committee. This meeting is to help us prepare for town meeting, which begins November 6th. I wish to thank the following Belmont Media Center and Matt Simonelli and Bonnie Friedman, for tele Matt for televising the program and Bonnie for helping Jeffrey. May I introduce the chairman of the evening and the chairman of the Warren Committee, Jeffrey Lubin. Jeff? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'll bring up the presentation. That will help us walk through the articles for special town meeting. But as I bring that up, uh, I believe uh, the moderator, Mike Woodmer, would like to make a few comments. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. First, as I said in my email to town meeting members, this uh, meeting, special town meeting, will be a bit of an experiment. It will be an in-person meeting, but at the same time, we are uh, allowing or arranging for those who have special circumstances and are unable to attend in person to be able to attend uh, virtually. So um, as I said, it's a bit of an experiment. We haven't done this before. I wanna say this is a huge amount of work. This is not like a simple conference room hybrid meeting. I wanna thank Ellen Cushman and the town clerk staff for the work they're doing, IT, Belmont Media, the schools. This has taken an enormous amount of planning and we hope it'll come off well. Uh, at the same time, I would ask, we would all ask the indulgence of town meeting members if we have a hiccup or two, um, that you be patient and we can deal with it. We would like this to work, um, uh, obviously, so that we can have an in-person meeting, but at the same time, have access for those who are unable to attend. Mm -hmm. Finally, it, uh, the town meeting, has three nights set aside, as you know, but certainly go two nights. Um, I think we'll probably need a third night. We'll have to see. So that's the 6th, 8th, and 13th. Uh, the main item the first night is civil service. The main item the second night will lead off will be the restaurants and parking, Article 6 and 7. CPA projects will follow that, and then the um, stretch code, energy stretch code, and then citizens petition. Um, I don't know that we can do all that in the second night. Therefore, it will probably spill over to the third night. So again, thank you all for all your service on behalf of Belmont. And thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mike. Okay, starting off. Uh, so for tonight, it's for uh, a warm briefing for special town meeting. Can I, Jeff, sorry, can I just add, Marianne Scally asked me to sure, add, and um, I thought Mike might have mentioned it. Because it is hybrid, um, everybody is asked to bring a device, a laptop or a um, tablet or a cell phone with that's smart to be able to use it for voting during town meeting, whether you're coming in person or you're doing it virtually that we're going to use the same voting system. So um, if you didn't see the email from Ellen Cushman, the town clerk, please look for it and please try to bring your device charged, but there will also be maps of where you can charge it in the room if necessary. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Okay. Here uh, is a list of articles. They are in the order that we're, that the moderators determined that we will uh, review them in. And so, you know, beginning with the standard reports and you can see uh, the list and these are the ones that we'll be going through tonight. So again, kind of the, uh, the format, uh, just as a reminder, and then for you that are, for those that are new to this meeting, we have representatives of the articles and, and town representatives to help give a quick overview. The main overview will be given at town meeting. So this is a quick overview, whether it comes from me or from a town representative or the article sponsor, but primarily they're here to answer clarifying questions. 
And in, in particular, these are about questions. Opinions uh, are, are saved for town meeting. This is just to get more information for town meeting members to prepare for town meeting. Uh, we're gonna do no more than two questions, two minutes each. And then if you have more questions, it'll be after town meeting, uh, after everyone has gone at least once. I will say at some point I need to table discussion and there could be follow-ups with email because we're just, we're, we need to finish up within the two hour time frame here tonight. So the list again, uh, just with the added information of who is the primary in terms of uh, the article. And you can see for some of them, we have uh, the town administrator's office. We have a couple citizens petitions. Uh, Amber, Angus Amercrombie will be reviewing that, Mac, Max Calise. And then we have uh, town department heads as well as a couple of committee members from the uh, Economic uh, Development Committee and, uh, and Community Development, as well as the police chief here for civil service. So I've already shown the number, but this is the order in which we'll take them up. And with that, I'll start off with article one. So this is uh, basically uh, allowing for reports to be given to town meeting. As of right now, these are tentatively scheduled for the second night. We will have a MBTA communities uh, presentation. And then on the third night, November 13th, the library building committee will be giving us an update. So moving right into the articles. Uh, the first one here is, is article four, capital appropriations for security cameras at the Wellington Chenery schools. Uh, if you read the italicized uh, uh, text, we uh, annual town meeting uh, had a total of funding of 1.79, almost 72 million, and only 1.63 was appropriated. So the difference is 160,000. And what we'd like to, what the town and schools would like to do is appropriate that to finish the uh, security cameras in all the schools. All the other schools were done through ARPA and the Chenery and Wellington are left, and these monies would be used to do that. With that, I will uh, hand it over to uh, Assistant Town Administrator, Finance Director, Jennifer Hewitt, if there's any more uh, information she would like to share. Thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, Jennifer Hewitt, Assistant Town Administrator, Finance Director. Um, this is just pretty straightforward. I think Jeff explained it pretty well. Um, the, I think the main thing to highlight is just that these are pretty straightforward. There's already security cameras in place, and it's uh, it's they're um, they've reached the end of their useful life, and it's time for them to be replaced and uh, and be somewhat enhanced. There are a couple of extra locations for them um, in some main corridors and stairwells, but uh, that's that's the extent of it. Dave Blazon is here too to answer any questions about that. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions? Bonnie, are you gonna field the question? I am okay. I am watching for them and we do not, but we have two. Oh, we now we have raised hands. Um yes. So um the first one is Lisa Pargoli. I'll let you speak, Lisa. Hi, thank you, Lisa Pagoli, precinct four, town meeting member. Yeah, you know, I, I my concern is that uh, it not the of course the security cameras for the kids, but the fact that it states that the town has to raise and appropriate the amount of one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, where it it really is a little annoying that the school itself gets like three quarters of the annual town budget and every little thing that they want. Has, Lisa, this is about asking why is that? Why is that not coming from the school? I think the question is you can ask the source of funding, but it's not again, okay. a question. So I think that's fair, but that's yeah, not what, why is that? Me. Well, I'd kind of like to know if I if, if people are going to be voting on it and appropriating the money. Jennifer, would you like to comment on the uh, 
Um, well, this is part of a, we, we do have an overall plan to update all the security cameras. Uh, the first phase was done at the schools. The town will be um, brought to Springtown meeting um, in, in April. All right. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Next is um, Angus uh, Abercrombie. Yeah, I just want to ask what the funding source is. I think we were starting to get to that. Um. Sure, thank you, Angus. So, so um, if I could, this is a little bit of a mea culpa. Um, I, all the way through the budget process, we were projecting that um, that seven one point seven nine one million that would be used for discretionary capital, and when we got to um, <clears throat> the list at the end, then the list that was voted at town meeting. Unfortunately, there were a lot of moving pieces with the ARPA and some other areas, and the 160 ended up falling off the list. So the budget was balanced, but it included an assumption that we were going to be spending $160,000 more than what was actually appropriated at town meeting last spring. So this just simply appropriates the remaining balance. So it's the tax levy. Next, we have Bill T. And when you speak, Bill, please identify your full name. Sorry, I don't realize it's there. Bill Trevelsi, town meeting member, uh, um, Precinct 7. Just, it seems like there's a little contradiction between the top line that says moved, which is four security cameras at two schools, Whereas in the body, in italics, it's an update at all schools. Is it both one, the other? Um, is, it, is it that, that there are no cameras at Wellington and Chenery now? And just, just to sort of have it all in agreement uh, would be good. Dave, could you take that? Certainly. Good evening, everyone. Dave Blazon, Director of Facilities for the Town of Belmont. Uh, there are existing cameras uh, that were installed with the schools. Um, as we went through the uh, the entire district, town, and schools, we did an all-encompassing audit of the equipment and found that you know most of all the cameras are old. If they're cloudy and um, they they need upgrading, there was a there was a number of um, <clears throat> areas that needed to be upgraded uh, for for better coverage at uh, back doors, stairwells, things like that. And uh, all, all the schools have cameras currently. Um, and this is just an upgrade to the... Uh, sounds like you got muted. So no, my question was really on clarification of how it's written. In one sense, it says, it's for cameras at two schools and the other, it says it's upgrade, it's for up, upgrades across the board. So you just might wanna. Yeah, I think it says the funds will complete a project to upgrade with these two being the last uh, ones, but we can uh, we can circle back on that. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, Chris Doyle, chair of the Comprehensive Capital Budget Committee would like to comment on this. Hi, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, um, the other schools were included in the um, in the um, rest of the um, capital list, and so the distinction I think here is that these two schools were um, uh, the uh, the uh, the second part of this project, whereas that sentence at the end refers to the camera project in total, if you will, including previous funds that were for cameras at the other schools. So the reference to all schools refers to the earlier part of the camera um, project writ large, if you will, and the 160 is specifically for the Wellington and the Chenery. And I will say the capital committee voted and ranked different projects. And obviously this project came out quite high um, on the list. Great, thank you. Any other questions on this article? There are no hands raised and no questions in the Q&A. Okay, we'll move on to the next. Next is um, Article 11, Appropriation from the Op Opioid Settlement Stabilization Fund. And I think it's probably best to just let uh, have Jennifer Hewitt uh, walk us through this. 
Thank you, Jeff. I'm Jennifer Hewitt, Assistant Town Administrator, Finance Director. Uh, so you will all recall that we established the Opioid Settlement Stabilization Fund at, uh, at the Spring Town Meeting, and then um, allocated, we transferred $107,000 into it. Um, the reason for that is that the opioid settlement is we are receiving almost a million dollars over the course of 17 years. Um, but we're very tightly restricted in how we can spend that funding. It has to be on only things that are allowed under the opioid settlement. Um, so, and that, that money has to be set aside and only spent on those, on those elements. We did that. We established the Settlement Stabilization Fund, and then we um, transferred the money that we received in FY23 into that. We've also received a small amount in FY24, and we've transferred that into it as well. Uh, the total in the it balance in the Stabilization Fund at this point is $125,000. Um, now, we need to make some plans and start to plan on how we're going to spend that funding. We started to meet internally, and we are gathering a group um, with starting to bring in some from the community and starting to plan about how best we can spend that, spend the funding. So this is an initial um, payment that will help that planning getting get going. It may fund some initial projects, but it's hard to tell until the group really gets going. So this is just that we wanted to be able to start working on it in the time between now and town meeting. Um, there might be some further activity at uh, the, the May or June town meeting, but more likely it would be next fall or perhaps the following year where we would be able to bring a robust, more robust plan to town meeting. Thank you. Uh, any questions on Article 11? Not at the moment. Okay, give it another second. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, so Article 8, removal from civil service, um, police. So this is for the police remo uh, uh, re removing from civil service, not the fire department. Um, here's the motion and, and, the, and a brief synopsis, but I know, um, would like to recognize the chair of the select board, Roy, uh, Epstein would like to sign, would like to make some comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Roy Epstein, Chair of the Select Board. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, in anticipation of this discussion tonight, I sent around every town meeting member a, a one pager that we had promised back in September to explain uh, why we're doing this. And the, the primary purpose is to address a, a fundamental um, inability to hire. Uh, police officers in sufficient number in a timely way and in a diverse way and giving the chief the, a sufficient choice of candidates to choose from. Uh, what I'll talk about actually at town meeting is just how difficult it's been to attract candidates at all for a good number of years. And uh, for the reasons I set out in the uh, in the one pager, withdrawal from civil service is really the only realistic solution for this. And it's something that at least 40 other towns in Massachusetts have also come to the same conclusion about. Uh, piecemeal approaches like changing local options on age limits and travel distances and so forth don't work. And the, the, the one proof, one, one way to see they don't work is that those options were considered by every other town that's left and they chose they, they recognized that leaving was really the only way to go. And I think the vast majority of towns that have left have been, uh, have recognized that it's been a superior option. So that, that's why we'd like to do it. Thank you, uh, Chief McIsaac, would you like to make a few comments? Thank you, Jeff. Take you questions. Know, I will be very brief because um, I know we don't have a whole lot of time and there's a lot of ground to cover here. So I'd rather open it up to questions as quickly as possible. Um, as you mentioned, um, this does not in any way include the fire department. And I think it's important to men mention that police officers that currently work for the police department now will remain in civil service. My intention uh, to transition the Belmont Police Department away from civil service was initially articulated by me 
during the very public interviews for the position of police chief. My objective was formally outlined in my first year plan that was presented to the department and our department's five-year strategic plan for the period of 2022 to 2027. We recognize the pressing issue of our department faces and challenges uh, in filling vacancies and attracting potential police officer candidates. Within that same plan under the section labeled objectives and strategies, it is outlined to remove the department from civil service. And if you wanna see that plan, you can go to belmontpd.org. In the town's 2022 annual report, removing the department from civil service is listed under goals for 2023. In addition, I've stated this goal at numerous public meetings, Belmont media interviews and town meeting uh, precinct uh, meetings. As uh, Selectman Epstein said, uh, we simply cannot uh, hire candidates through this process, and uh, we simply cannot diversify the department through this process. When I was going through the chief's uh, interviews, um, it, the, one of the, the person that was uh, conducting the process mentioned to me, he said, why haven't you called for a, um, a minority list from civil service? And, and I knew that you couldn't do that but I wanted to check. I had checked with director of operations at civil service, and there is no way to uh, basically diversify your department uh, through civil service other than recruiting among minorities in your community or selective language uh, where you need to prove to civil service that a vast majority of your calls that you respond to, uh, you respond to uh, for people that speak another language other than English, or the town is under a consent decree, um, which we were not. And diversity is a big part of it. It's a big part of building trust and legitimacy uh, amongst the police department. But more importantly, we can't uh, we can't hire uh, hire anybody. But the big change that um, has come up in law enforcement is that the police officers, peace officer standards and training, before known as POST, um, under, has uh, in in the police reform bill. There's a, a general law six e section ten f. And I'll read it. It provides that if post decertifies an officer and the and the employing agency then fires the officer, that decision cannot be appealed to civil service. So if a police officer is decertified and, and then terminated by the department, they can no longer appeal uh, their termination to post uh, to civil service. Um, unlike the fire department, they, they're still able to do that. Police officers are not able to do that. And um, in addition to those communities that Selectman Epstein talked about in October, the Mass Chiefs of Police uh, distributed a survey among the chiefs uh, that are in civil service. And there were 76 communities, civil service police departments that responded to that survey. And the survey was, do you have any plans to get out of civil service or do you want to stay in civil service? Of the 76 communities surveyed, 40, which is just over half, said that they were either leaving civil service or they were exploring uh, leaving civil service. So there's a reason for that. That's because my colleagues that are chiefs in communities that are no longer in civil service, the police departments are no longer in service, are having a great deal of success in hiring candidates and filling vacancies. So um, I will leave it at that and open, open it up to questions because I'm sure there's a lot of questions. And otherwise, I, I'll just... I'll cover too much ground and, and we'll miss a lot. So I think I'd rather just open it up to questions now. Thank you, Chief McIsaac. We have several questions. Uh, I'll start with the one that was typed into the chat uh, or the Q&A um, from Michael McNamara. I wanted to ask uh, to get a bit more clarification on the potential for a greater applicant diversity. Belmont is an increasingly diverse town with a sizable Asian American population. We only have a few officers who are from those communities. How will this change from going out of civil service assist in this goal? Um, thank you for the question. Well, uh, right now, um, this will, will get us into it. In order to be hired by the Belmont Police, um, civil service has a number of preferences, but what we're concerned about is in order to get residential preference in Belmont, you have to have resided in the town of Belmont, your permanent home for one year prior to the exam. Um, we don't have, uh, we, we have one candidate right now, one person took the test uh, from 
we had three people on the list, but only one person is interested in being the job. So we had three people take the job in April. Only one is uh, is going through with the process. After that, you have uh, disabled veterans, and then you have um, veterans, and then non-resident, uh, non-veterans. You also have uh, preferences for, for police off for the sons and daughters of police officers and firefighters who were killed in the line of duty and who were uh, permanently injured in the line of duty. They go to the top of, um, of every, every civil service list. So to your question, there's no guarantee that we're gonna uh, have um, you know, uh, a diverse police force within two years of leaving civil service, but there's, it's certainly not gonna happen while we're in civil service. Um, we're gonna, we're being out of civil service, we're gonna be able to run ads, we're gonna be able to run our own exams, we're gonna be able to recruit. Uh, from college campuses, just like many businesses in uh, throughout Massachusetts do. So leaving civil service will certainly uh, open us up to, to a wider candidate pool. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we'll switch now to the hands raised and then um, there's another question written, but that came in la later. Um, Angus Abercrombie is first. Yeah, I, so, it's this would trigger impact bargaining with the police unions uh if we were to approve the article my question is is there a reason other than timeline that you know any procedural or legal reason why that negotiation couldn't have started and potentially ha have reached some kind of agreement before we got to the point of asking town meeting to vote on it Chief, why don't you describe uh, what happened starting in 2021? So, so this, I'm uh, going through my paperwork here. The, um, there's three things that you, there's four things that you need to bargain with the union on this. And that is uh, layoffs, promotions, discipline, and um, you know, the first one is layoffs, promotions, discipline, and let me find it. Seniority. Those uh, those need to be impact bargain. In 2021, we presented to both unions uh, language draft language that covered those uh, those areas that needed. They covered seniority, discipline, promotions, and um, and layoffs. We we attempted to negotiate as best we could with the unions. Um, it it didn't didn't work out, but they have seen those. Uh, they've had those those draft since 2021. So here we are uh, now at this point. Uh, the contracts are closed, and if town meeting uh, takes us out, then we'll we'll bargain seniority, layoff, discipline, and promotions with the union. One thing you have to uh, understand is when, when police departments and, and even fire, fire, fire departments, when they reach an impact, impa, uh, impasse in bargaining, they can go to the Joint Labor Relations Commission. Um, the JLMC is not going to entertain, um, they're not gonna make a determination on a, a, a question like civil service because they have no control over the town meeting. So, um, this was on the advice of council. This was the best way to proceed uh, moving forward. Our next question is from Dave Lind. Good evening, this is Dave Lind. Um, I, as we were talking through this, I was recalling the similar conversation we had a couple of years ago. And I recall the select board pulling this motion right at the very end due to some concerns over the promotion process and that being unfair to people who are already in flight with that process. I was curious if the way the motion is put forth this time, um, if that issue has been mitigated or if that is something that is still the case, but just accepted. So, yeah, Jeff, could I, 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 I as, as I re as I recall it, uh, so last time it was police and fire. Um, I don't know what the, the fire 
Um, you know, the, the fire, uh, from my experience, um, and I'm not going to speak for Chief DeStefano, but fire unions are very, uh, view civil service different than, um, just civil service differently than the police unions. I don't remember the promotional thing coming up. Um, we did just did have a, uh, so of the 21 available patrol officers who, uh, were available to take the sergeant's exam. Only four signed up to take the exam, which is a whole nother problem with civil service that I, I can explain. But uh, if the patrol officers union wants me to honor those scores or that list when that comes out, I have no problem uh, doing and, and Dave, let me just add, because I, I was the chair of the select board at the time and made the decision to pull the article. The, the issue was entirely a scheduling conflict between the town meeting vote and the fact that a number of firefighters had studied for close to a year to take a promotion exam. And there was an unfortunate mix up where it turned out that had the vote proceeded, those firefighters, we had committed to the firefighters that they'd be able to proceed with their promotional exam. It was a most unfortunate uh, mix up where had the vote proceeded at that time, that would have affected the firefighters ability to do that. We that that problem we having learned from that experience, that's not going to be a factor this time. Okay, because that issue was only related to firefighter process as opposed well, to and and the and the particular timing of the exam. So there, there's nothing in the exam schedule now that's going to be affected by by the a decision by town meeting now. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Jean Mooney. Hi, Jean Mooney, town meeting member, precinct six. Um, thank you very much for hosting this. Um, last night in an information meeting, it was brought up about report um, HD uh, 5005, the final report for the civil service special commission. And it was suggested um, that that report may have some um, outcomes or suggestions um, that could be useful to implement um, before leaving civil service. Um, and but my my question to the chief of the select board is, you know, have have you read um, that report? And um, is there anything in there that would change your mind, or does that report, um, you know, uh, would that supersede anything? Obviously, I haven't heard you say that, but uh, since that report was specifically cited, I wanted to know your thoughts on what was in that report. Um, I read the report. Gene, I, I, I view it as uh, paving the cow path. You know, it's the, the, a lot of those things have been mentioned before. In uh, 1992, Bill Weld came in, uh, tried to make changes to civil service. There was a commission much like the one you just uh, referred to in 1996. Basically, it has to move through the legislature. We see, we've seen it with our own legislation that we filed in 2016 that I testified once again on uh, just, just several weeks ago. I don't, all these changes need to be made through the legislature by, by changes in law. It, um, it, it makes, you know, I, 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 if, I'm, if I'm correct, New Jersey and Massachusetts, the only two states in the country right now that have this centralized uh, civil service hiring process for municipal governments. You know, it's the time has, has come and gone. Um, a lot of the things they're recommending is just like, okay, then let's just get out of civil service. Um, what's the sense? But I don't really think uh, any of the changes that they've made, uh, they, they've proposed in there are gonna, gonna work. One of them is very similar to the bill we proposed. And um, I just don't, you know, this isn't a, the other thing I want to tell people, this isn't a new problem. This didn't come from police reform. This didn't come because everyone's having a hard time hiring people. This predates 2016, 2015. And, you know, civil service from the time I called the, the, the director of operations and asked him about uh, diversifying our department, they've been acutely aware of this problem that communities like Belmont have and Wellesley have and Lexington have and Westwood have, and they've done nothing to help us. They, they've, they've let that bill linger. Uh, it's a, a very simple bill that would, would allow people with a high school diploma to, to receive residential preference in the community that adopts it. And they've done nothing to help us. Um, I'm not real confident that I'm waiting around. I don't think I'll be chief by the time those changes are made. And everybody else, I've, I've attended enough meetings. 
where they say, oh, the problem is we don't have funding. We don't have funding. They want funding. That was mentioned in the report that, that you referenced as well. So what I'm hearing is that uh, it, it doesn't make, um, it might help um, people who are staying in civil service, but it's not going to fix the, the problems that you've, you've outlined. No. Yep. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why the, the state legislature is not moving on some of these communities that have, have opted to get out of civil service. They're trying to, they're, 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 Thank digging, you. they're digging their heels in trying to save civil service because there's, there's a mass exodus coming because everybody knows it's, it's better to be out. Thank you, Chief. Our, our next question is um, written in the Q&A. Um, Deanna Earl, Precinct 7 town meeting member, says from Tuesday meeting, for those who aren't aware, there was a private, well, a, a meeting that three town meeting members organized um, about civil service. It seemed that the removal from civil service in other Massachusetts communities did not improve. Is this correct? No, I have um, at, the, at our last uh, public meeting that we had before the Warren committee, someone mentioned, I heard Westwood can't hire anybody. So I called the, the Westwood chief Linehan right afterwards. He said, we're not having problems. He said, we have three vacancies. I have nine certified candidates uh, that I'm interviewing next week. I have testimonials from Burlington, Reading, Lexington, Norwood, Wellesley, Cohasset, and Weston. I just spoke to the Cohasset chief yesterday. He came out of civil, their department came out of civil service in January. He said, we have had no problem uh, hiring people. And uh, I'll give you, I'll just read this. Burlington PD, this is 2022. This was last year. Um, I asked them how that they, how they uh, hired. We use police exam solutions. Uh, they charge the applicant and we pay nothing. Since the test has a psychological evaluation component, we get test scores and psychological profiles. That's a saving for us. We then identify priorities, but we why we also identified the score. We had about 220 people take the test and 157 pass the written test. I don't know how you uh, you argue with that. I'll admit Burlington, uh, their offices are very well paid, but um, that's that's a lot of people uh, to go through that. In my career, we haven't gone through, uh, even when I, from the time I was a patrolman, 157 candidates that have walked, walked haven't been through this process. And I got Lexington, I have Reading, I have, uh, and I'd be happy to share their emails with you. And there's nobody that's out of civil service that's complaining. The, the Wellesley chief, when I asked him, he gave me the union president's name and number. He said, have your, your people call, have the officers here call the union president and he'll tell them how great it is uh, being out. Our next question is from Mary Lewis. You can speak now. Hi, um, uh, Mary Lewis from Precinct One. I have a question about the process. If town meeting votes in favor of leaving, can you outline the precise process afterwards? For instance, if you have the same kind of stumbling blocks with negotiations that you had in 2021 and negotiations fail. Does that mean we're out of town meeting or we're just still in town meeting and, uh, sorry, town meeting, interesting slip, that we're out of civil service um, or that we stay in it until those negotiations are successful? Um, at what point do we petition to the state? If you could just really like lay out the step-by-step -step process that happens after the town meeting vote, I, it would help me better understand whether this is binding, um, not a suggestion, et cetera. Thank you. So if town, if, if town council was here, he would be perfect for answering this, but I'll, I'll do my best and I'm sure I'm, I'm correct at what I'm gonna tell you. When a contract is open and you're negotiating, that's called a successor agreement. The things that you're negotiating in that agreement are um, open to um, arbitration if you reach impasse uh, during the successor agreement. Uh, but as I mentioned, um, if we if we the successor agreement was open and we were negotiating this, uh, an arbiter would not rule on on the civil service. So the the contracts are closed. So now what you do is what, what is called impact bargain uh, these issues. And if you don't reach an agreement, which 
I'm, I'm certainly will because I don't know what uh, obstacles I would throw up in, in terms of management to to make things different. Our goal is to make it to mirror civil service in every way. But if um, if we, from what I understand, and if there's a labor attorney, they can, they can argue. If we if we reach an impasse, then the town can implement um, the 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 what the proposals were that that, that we have. Yeah. And, yeah, but I, I think Mary was asking also a, a, an additional question. Ma Mary, th this does not go to the state. This in yeah. Belmont, this is purely a local decision of town meeting. And the reason for that is you exit town meeting the same way you get in. And in Belmont, it was purely a town meeting decision in 1915. So it's purely a town meeting decision to exit. And the vote for town meeting settles that question. Thank you. That is the thrust of the main thrust of my question. So if we vote yes, then all that's left to be done is to negotiate the terms of it. Right. And that negotiation uh, either gets resolved locally or, or it can go to an arbitrator if there's an impasse. But there is a solution. Thank you for answering that. Thank you. Next, we have a written question again. Allison Link asks, uh, says, my understanding is that both fire and police unions don't support leaving civil service. Given this, how do you justify making this move? Well, I've stated before, I really have no interest in what the fire department thinks. Um, I'm not a firefighter. I've never been a firefighter. So I really, you know, um, if the school was revamping their hiring policies and I went to a, a school committee meeting and say, disagreed with it, I don't know what the school committee would think. Um, I really, the fire department, I have really no interest in. Uh, with the police officers, um, you know, I didn't listen to the, uh, the meeting the other day. As I've mentioned, I read all that. Uh, it's in our, our plan. It's in our, nobody's ever come to me and said, Chief, you're crazy. This is going to ruin the department. You know, Chief, don't do this. Nobody's ever said that. I've had conversations with them. We proposed it in negotiation. I've told them this is coming. And, um, you know, this, this is where we are. You know, we, we can't, you know, they're not, the, the officers that are here now are going to remain in civil service. But as I said before, I feel as though I wouldn't be much of a manager if I wasn't trying to bring in the best possible candidates for this job. As I've said before, you know, this, this isn't firefighting, this isn't teaching, this isn't, uh, you know, other, you know, budget work, not that those jobs are, are, are any less, but we provide a firearm to these, these offices. We provide the ability for them to take people's freedom away and the ability to use force. And I gotta have I gotta fill four positions with one candidate when I have a when I have our lowest uh, salaried position in the department as our records clerk and I gotta go through thirty resumes to hire one records clerk. But with police officers, hey, if you lived in the town for twelve months prior to uh, taking the exam and you got a seventy on the test, welcome aboard. And uh, that's that's no way to to fill these positions. Um, our next question is from Laura Burns. Hi, this is Laura Burns from Precinct 6. Um, I understand that civil service has a whole, you know, it has a series of tests and whatnot that they adjudicate and uh, vet candidates for. Um, what is the, I mean, there seems to be a lot of logistics that they handle. It seems, what is, would that then fall on Belmont to come up with their own test and figure out how to do that and administer it and organize that as well? It seems like uh, a fair amount of, of work. Well, actually, it's the opposite. Civil service does the test, and um, we do everything else. We ask them for a list. They provide us with the list. Once right. we get the list, we conduct the interviews. We conduct the background investigation, the psychological, the physical, and we so, move, we move so from there. So all they so all they do is I mean they, but they but they handle the, the test and there's yeah. a the, okay so then all we would have to take on is handling the test we don't even have to do that the companies that provide the tests um, they they all they ask is that we provide a space for them to to take the exam the person taking the test uh, pays usually a fee it's anywhere from 120 to 150 dollars for the test. We get the scores within seven days. Um, you can do the test a lot of different ways. 
one of the big problems that departments are having right now is so we 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 just we hired a some we have a candidate who took civil service test in April. We hired him in July. Now, before he goes to the academy in April, he has to pass a physical abilities test that is not easy to pass. It's a mile run, it's uh, push up, sit ups, and it's 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 pretty tough. So if, if he doesn't pass that test, he's out. Um, and we've wasted almost half a year on trying to get him into the academy. These departments that are outside of civil service, the day they give the exam, they tell the candidates, bring your shorts and sweatpants, and they put them through a PAT test that day to see which ones are, are gonna can, can get fast track to be hired, or mm -hmm. which ones, you know, they, they wait for the scores of the test and they um they they give them time to get to get hired. But it's also um, uh, Laura, there are there are third party companies that have specialized in handling this and they're very efficient as the chief has outlined and it's very uh, low cost and for the most part there's no cost to the town at all but that, that's why another reason why so many other towns have gone this way because the whole process is vastly more streamlined having these independent three third party test givers i, I just I, I'll, just a clarification about who makes those tests fair is there some is there like how does how is that handled so uh, i'll give you an idea um Russ Stevens from Pitt Public Safety Consultants um, goes on. He says the examinations has been validated according to the professional standards imposed by the uniform guidelines on employee selection procedures and the principles of validation and use of personnel selection procedures. So, you know, whatever, I'm not even sure of that validation, but they, they, they hold up. But if, if you want to talk about tests, I mean, my office has studied for an entire year and took a, a 2022 sergeant's exam from state police only to have a judge throw it out because he said it was it was racist and basically didn't mean anything. And so, you know, that, you know, none of these tests, as far as I know, have been have been flagged for that. I'm sorry, you're saying that the civil service test was race, racist? The, yeah, a judge ruled that the civil service test, the sergeant's exam they were given was, was racist. And I forget the other term he used. And so they, they uh, less than a, it couldn't have been a month after the officers took the test, they, they, all their scores got thrown out. So they had to wait almost an entire year uh, and study again for a brand new test. They waited about six months for the new test. All right, thank you. The next question is written again. Michael McNamara says, what type of guarantee can the town residents and taxpayers receive from the select board leadership on strict ethics rules and protections from any potential conflict of interest in hiring in regards for civil service if we leave it. Uh, Roy Epstein, chair of the select board. The, uh, Belmont has adopted a law uh, called strong chief. So the select board uh, and the town administrator play no role in hiring at all. There's simply no role for it. The hiring is solely done by the chief and the chief, as chief just explained, there are going to be published hiring guidelines. Uh, if somebody is not hired, I guess what, uh, chief, if you could explain, is there a grievance, procedure, uh, a grievance procedure if somebody feels they were not hired for, um, if they were not hired unfairly? There is, and there's a, this is a draft policy. It's recruit, recruiting and selection of police officers and civilians employees as well. It has 23 uh, mass police accreditation standards within it. Um, I didn't obviously write it, but um, it's a it's a policy that we adopt that we would adopt, and we would have to uh, to stand by. And it gives people the ability to uh, to file an appeal if they feel as though that they should have been hired. Um, again, everything's on the level. You're going to hear you're going to hear about the Wellesley uh, fire chief if you haven't already. I mean, I've heard it so much that he hired his son and and he was ultimately fined by the ethics commission um and they they talk about that i mean was, you know as if that's why we shouldn't get out of civil service so be, why because one fire chief in in one community in massachusetts in 2019 uh, got involved in the hiring of his son and he paid a fine for it and as far as i know he's still working so the the select board obviously didn't you know didn't think what he did was was that bad but um you know 
we're, we're just we're, we're going to be like every other department in town when it comes to when it comes to hiring. But we're, we're going to give exams and we're going to give. We're also going to take lateral transfers. Right now, one of the greatest things that happened with the the, the police reform and, and the creation of post is every police officer in Massachusetts is certified. Those are the those are the Boston College police officers. Those are you know uh, UMass Amherst police officers. And those offices now are, are available to take lateral transfers into the communities that are out of civil service. Even a police officer out state, out of state, who's um, who's certified out of state, if he's got good or she has good certification, they can come into Belmont, uh, take a like a take take an academy and and be hired. In civil service, you can't do that. Ronnie, well, why don't we? Uh... Uh, answer the remaining questions and any further questions will have to be addressed after because in the interest of time. Yes, and um, there are many. Um, I I'd we... also, yeah, I would just I, I just wanted to remind people that the League of Women Voters is having a lunchtime discussion on civil service tomorrow with representatives from the fire department in town, the police department in town, um, both our union um, representatives, and somebody from the Massachusetts Civil Service Commission, in addition to Chief McIsaac. So if um, we don't get to your question tonight, I recommend you join us tomorrow. You should have all gotten a flyer from the town clerk today or some other way, or you can go to the League of Women Voters Facebook page or our website. Um, so I'll try to go through what I have of the questions as quickly as we can and um, not repeat things that have been asked. Um, if exit is immediate based on what you said before, somebody changed their question, shouldn't we add a transition period of, say, six months? And I'm sorry, that was um, asked by Brian Eiler or Iller. Well, I have four vacancies with only one candidate right now, and um, I'm probably going to have a couple more vacancies in six months. So I would like to hire it as soon as possible to get that process. In, term, in terms for clarifying, in terms of transition, the existing staff will be all under civil service, correct? That's correct. And so I shouldn't have probably said spoken to that would probably be you know a policy decision that we would we would create with the board and with HR um, to see what what they want to do. But it, I would you know I would foresee putting out an ad for laterals uh, immediately if we were to come out of civil service. But it is um, important to emphasize that all current police officers remain in civil service. It's only the new people who come on board who would be outside of civil service. And uh, I don't know why they're, I don't know what a transition period would do. We, we would proceed directly to impact bargaining and, and settle the whole, uh, all the remaining questions that the, uh, that the chief identified. Let's try to keep going through the questions. Um, Catherine Bonfiglio, said Arlington voted to remove only hiring from civil service, a hybrid approach. Can you comment on this approach? Yes, so uh, Arlington and Tewksbury, they, they have bills before the legislature, which uh, Arlington didn't testify and Tewksbury didn't even bother testifying. When I asked to the, the Tewksbury chief, he said he didn't think it was gonna go anywhere, but what they tried to do, and so did Attleboro, was they tried to remove the the hiring process from civil service. So you would take that process out, you would be allowed to hire whoever you wanted. And then after that the person was in the department for a year, they would be entering into civil service. And, and there's no way the state legislator, if they have any connections with civil service is gonna allow that because the fees collected by civil service for the exams is probably one of the biggest money makers uh, going into their budget. And those those proposals um, recommend eliminate that. If it was successful, but but I doubt it's going to be. Um, you know that would be something that it, it, that would be attractive to to us. But um, it's not going to happen. I don't think. I could say with ninety nine percent surety, it's not going to happen. And they David Webster. Sorry, I thought you were done. David Webster is our next question. I'll let him 
speak. Thank you. Can you hear me? This is David Webster, Precinct 4. Can you hear? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay, so this has to go to the previous question of negotiations prior to votes, and it might be appropriate for Rory Epstein and, or Corey Taylor. Is there some sort of um, prohibition on that? Is that what you mean by contracts are closed? I hear uh, the chief talk about a draft um, a draft policy and in, in Roy Epstein's um, one pager it talks about a draft contract language going leaving about leaving civil service shared two years ago was that in the last negotiations um, has that been reflected on um, are, are both parties amenable to informal informally talk about it or is there a prohibition on that uh, chief correct me if I'm wrong but the this language has been was presented more than two years ago, the unions actually never responded. So it, it's just been out there. And um, the, the contract the chief was referring to was the general, uh, uh, comp the, the three-year contract that's normally entered into with the police. That, that's been closed out now. So the only thing left is bargaining on these narrow topics of, uh, promotion, uh, termination, discipline, that would be subject of impact bargaining. And the result of that would be bolted on to the contract that just got concluded. But and hiring isn't in there. But because they don't have, that's not a, uh, that's not a benefit that they have. It's not, it doesn't um, touch on, on them, the hiring. I but you're going to, but, but after the vote, you're going to negotiate about it. So, oh, you, but, but you're four. prohibited from you're prohibited from negotiating beforehand. So, and if that's what's forcing town meeting to have to vote, well, we tried to negotiate beforehand. No, we we we've been trying to move this along for two years, David, and there's been uh, zero movement. Okay. Is a union have a perspective on that or not, or do you want to share? No, not, uh, we're not hearing from the union tonight. We can just. Um... Okay, fine. Uh, Bonnie, can we have uh, Chris Doyle, chair of the Comprehensive Budget Committee, wants to make uh, a comment? Yes, certainly. Oh, Chris? hi. Yeah, and it's actually a question, and I'm not. Oh, my right. question isn't. Uh, it isn't in my capacity for the capital committee because, of course, civil service has nothing to do with the with capital. Um, I just wanted to ask the chief how many vacancies you've had, um, you know, on average over the past three or four years, um, and also how many uh, people you've had. I know you've also I, I seem to remember from warrant committee that you've had a couple people um out on you know national guard or whatever so i'm wondering how understaffed you've been over the last few years that's one question and my second question is how many um women are on the force we've been way understaffed um off the top of my head i'm going to say we have seven female officers we had janice fox retire um last year and we had uh, another female leave um in 2020 2016, we tried to fill one vacancy, and we had we had only two people sign the list. We needed three, um, so we had to request additional candidates. Uh, three additional candidates were added and signed that they would accept, so we hired one. Interestingly, in 2017, uh, as written in the annual report, this is the first time the department has been fully staffed to the budgeted number in many years. But unfortunately, in 2018, the department had three vacancies. Seven candidates uh, were, were Belmont candidates on the list. Three signed that they would accept the position. One backed out, we hired two. 2019, we had four vacancies. We had 30 candidates were notified. Six were Belmont residents. 21 were disabled veterans. Three were veterans, non-residents. Five candidates signed the list. Of that five candidates, Two withdrew and we only had two left. Those two could not pass that PAT test that I talked about for an entire year. I tried to get them into four academies and they could not pass it for a whole year. 921, the department had five vacancies. We had 31 candidates notified. Six Belmont residents were on that list. 22 disabled veterans, three veterans. Six candidates signed the list. Only three applied and we hired them. In July of 2022, 
We had five vacancies, 52 candidates were notified. There were only five Belmont residents on the list, 30 disabled veterans, 17 uh, veterans, non-residents. Seven signed the list. And of that list, we only hired two. July, 2023, the department had four vacancies, which we have now. We had 44 candidates notified. There were only three Belmont residents on the list, 21 veterans, non-residents, 19 disabled veterans, four signed the list, and only one submitted an application. And that's the, the, the one we're, we're waiting on and hoping that he gets into an academy in, um, in uh, January. So right now we're running with four vacancies. We have an officer out on long-term disability and we have two off two supervisors out on the National Guard. So that's that's seven uh, vacancies that we have. That, and that's why we overexpend our overtime budget uh, every year. Uh, probably we hit our, we hit the, the max on our overtime budget by January. Thank you. I'd like to keep getting through the questions. Marie Warner asks, I understand that the residency and age requirement can be lifted while remaining in civil service. The chief has described losing an Amesbury candidate due to the mileage and reg residency restriction. So this may help hiring. Can Belmont request lifting the age and mileage restrictions? And does town meeting need to vote on that? Um, well, let me start by saying, I've never mentioned that we lost someone on the mileage thing. Um, that's, that's, that's news to me. We did lose uh, two candidates going back since about 2014 on the upper age limit of 32 that the town adopted at the request of Chief Fire Osterhaus uh, back in the early 2000s, which states that you have to be under the age of 32 uh, when you take the exam. Um, as far as towns uh, removing the residential uh, requirement or preference, the only town in Massachusetts that does that is Bonstable. And Bonstable's moving to get out of civil service this year um, because they just left with a, 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 a your list starts with disabled veterans, veterans, and then non-residents. Plus, the other thing, the other good thing civil service do, did that doesn't help very much is when I took the civil service exam, you put down the community where you wanted residential preference, and then you could select from believe, I believe, two more communities or maybe three more communities. Now, when an exam taker takes the test. They put down where they want residential preference, and then they can check an unlimited number of communities where they're willing to work. So you could take the civil service test and check every community that civil service in Massachusetts that you would work there. Uh, but uh, none of these things have have helped uh, any of these communities. But Chief, oh. the, 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 sorry, the, the, the residential issue is, is it creates confusion because residency enters in two ways. One is a residential preference to be hired in the first place. Secondly, Belmont has adopted in its contracts a, 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 an agreement with the union that an officer reside within 15 miles of Belmont. That, that's something that was negotiated locally. We don't have to go to the legislature for that. Right. The, the, there was the suggestion that somehow the 15 mile radius became a much larger number. Would we get a lot more applicants who would be willing to take the job because they could live further away and make a big commute. It's it's not 15 miles. We, we we negotiated that several years ago and increased it to 20 miles. And that's as the crow flies border to border. Okay, and the 20 miles is already actually further than many other communities. Mm -hmm. But the I think the best proof that widening that radius doesn't work is twofold. One is it, re it results in a very long travel time for the most part. And there is a practical requirement, not only for somebody to be willing to have that commute, but they, they need to be able to respond in an emergency. But secondly, for the many, many towns, and we're talking about more than 40 towns that have withdrawn from civil service recently, they all have the same policy of a, of a residency radius of of 10, 15, 20 miles, they all had that choice of, of widening the radius or, or um, leaving civil service. And they all chose to leave because they recognized that widening the radius was just not gonna have the effect that's been claimed. That's, that also is, I think you stated, that's not a civil service law. It's chapter 41, section 99A that uh, 
that manages the distance that an, a, an officer can live from there. Right, and, but it's adopted in the local contract. Yeah. Bonnie, how many more questions do we have outstanding? Um, we have Bill T, Judith Feinleib, who got their hands raised before you said something, Ira, who raised his hand just as you were saying something, Deanna Earl had a follow-up question, and Ira put his question in Q&A in addition to raising his hand. Bill T mm -hmm. sort of did How about it. we uh, answer the, uh, we take the questions of the, the individuals that have had their hand raised and anyone, any other ones that have come in, we'll, we'll record and get, and get back to them. Okay, so Bill T is next then. All right, thanks for that. Sorry, I don't have the last name on there. Bill Trubilsi, Precinct 7. This is a little adjunct to the whole conversation, but it's with respect to the logistics and the mechanics of town meeting addressing this article, is there any plan to put a very sort of concise table that, prior, that shows the rationales and the priorities as to why this is being asked in, in a tabular form? Because um, just I'm thinking of the messiness that it might come of it and that that would sort of be a preventive uh help to 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 you know put this out all the things you've been saying but in a nice sort of cohesive way in a table i think is generally a good thing to go a good way to go um again the mechanics of the town meeting with regard to this could be very messy and i think something like that help any plan on any thought of doing that well i uh Bill, this is Roy Epstein. I, I'm actually going to make a short uh, presentation at town meeting, uh, which I, I don't have a table, but I will now add a table uh, since you've suggested it. But uh, we, we will try to make this as digestible as possible. Right. That, that's the goal. I mean, if there are five, six, you know, key things that are the drivers and the hope, the intended outcomes and the motivations, that's going to, I think, go a long way. Understood. Th thanks for the suggestion. Sure. Next is Judith Feinleib. Right. Judith Feinleib, town meeting member, precinct six. It sounds to me, from what I've just heard, as though there are some policies or and procedures, and perhaps both, that are at least in draft form. Why are we not being given them as town meeting members so we know what might replace civil service should we desire to vote out? In other words, I'm suggesting that we should see this before we vote to leave. And Chief, what's actually, when you refer to documents being available at belmontpd.org, right. what, what's there exactly? Because I haven't seen them. That that's the the belmontpd.org is the um, is the the five year strategic plan. That's not what um, okay. is, is being asked. I think um, to to answer your question, I mean, it, there's generally you don't like to to share things that you you're, you're going to be bargaining with um, the unions with, and um, I don't you know where it, it, it's mentioned they, they have it if they wanted to to share it uh they, they're happy to um i don't know um you know i would have to i would talk to uh town council before i i released it um, but i but we can clarify say... i'm sorry boy may i clarify sure thank you what i'm saying is that optimally the town and the unions would negotiate. They would come to, you guys would come to an agreement or perhaps you might, but if you do, then you would come to town meeting. And until then we would not vote to leave. Judith, we know that's your position. The unions have had our proposal for more than two years. That's not my um, understanding. Yeah. It's, it's actually many pages of, of a dense contract language. I, I don't know that it's, uh, wise or appropriate or even workable for town meeting to be reviewing draft contract language like that. It, it's uh, the, the unions know what it is and we're happy to negotiate it with them. Well, negotiate away and then come to us. Well, we, we've been trying to do that for more than two years. 
keep going. Okay. Um, let's try to finish this up. Um, Ira has the next question. And if, um, Ira, if you can give your last name, please. Would you like, I, he also wrote the question so I can. Ira, read. you're muted. Am I still muted? Nope. Now you're fine. Okay. Sarah Morgan Stern, I mean, member precinct seven. And uh, I had, uh, I have a number of questions. I only ask one now. Um, how long have the other towns taken to finalize these new contract terms? That's a good question. Uh, they all vary on um you know the they, they vary on what the give and take was um that they, they, they it, it varies on different towns some of the smaller communities out west in western massachusetts that um that have a real hard time hiring people the the unions came to them and said please take us out of civil service um other towns they uh they it it depends it depends on on you know, uh, the community where they're, they're at at that time. Um, it's been different. It, it's different in each community. What is the range though? What's the actual, is it six months? Is it seven months? Is it three months? To, excuse me, you mean like to negotiate? To negotiate and finalize. How long does uh, it take? So, well, depending on, depending on how the community got into civil service, uh, incidentally, Bedford's going to be coming out next. Now, I don't know if Bedford um, is like us or if Bedford needs to have a home rule petition sent to the state house. If Bedford needs to have a home rule petition sent to the state house, um, they're not approving them right now. Uh, because that was my question, I I'm sorry, maybe I misunder I misstated my question. Um, I understand that if we do vote to leave civil service, then there is a negotiation with the police union on four basic points. That's probably the same negotiation process that many of the other towns went through uh, when they exited. And what I'm trying to find out is how long it took other towns, give me a range, to finalize those negotiations with their police union well i can't i can't because it depends you know i don't know which towns are doing it like we did it other towns uh you know there's there's no secret here right you, you're better off going into town meeting with the unions on your side this question and answer would have ended 35 minutes ago um you know so there's other towns they everybody's done it differently um, I don't anticipate having lengthy negotiations, um, as Roy, uh, as Selectman Epstein said, they've had the, the, the draft language since for two years now. Um, I, I think that we will be able to move very quickly on this. I, in, in I, I, Ira, we, I, I certainly don't know. You know, we're talking about more than 40 towns. I, I just don't know what their experience was, but what I can say, and I think the union understands because they've reviewed the language, the intent in everything we're doing for promotion, um, uh, discipline, and termination procedures is to replicate existing civil service features. So there, we, I, I would imagine we could come to an agreement rather quickly. I, okay. Uh, I will I'm, state this too, not just because it comes up, just because I think it's important. No police officer that I know of in in, in the 25 years I've been on the job, or even before, has ever taken discipline to civil service. None. Because they do far better off in, in an arbitration, uh, it is, in an independent arbiter. And we've never had anyone take uh, discipline to civil service, other than a termination that was before post, and uh, that candidate ended up withdrawing. Okay. I'd like to just... Hey. Um, I'd like to just get to a tiny question of clarification that would then answer almost everything that people put in. Just what, when we talk about diversity, Chief, can you explain what you mean by diversity in terms of ethnicity, language, race, gender, any 
are you trying to do it on all different aspects? So we want, you know, we want to, uh, we want to fill vacancies and recruit police officer candidates to be able to sympathize and understand the points of views of all of our residents. You know, as I stated before about us carrying firearms, taking people's, you know, we, we have the ability to take people's freedom away temporarily. You know, we have a lot of people that come to the town, they work in the town. It's it to see a police officer that maybe looks like you or can uh, can better understand the feelings you're having. That's what diversity is about. That's why we want to have diversity in the department. And so that's basically what what I'm talking about is, uh, you know, police officers that look like the, the public out in Belmont, that are able, more able to understand different point of views, and they bring that diversity into the department. I mean, is anybody arguing that diversity is a bad thing? Um, we want diversity in the department. And, and uh, you know, it makes us, makes us stronger and it builds trust and legitimacy. Thank you, Chief McIsaac and uh, Roy. Um, Clearly a lot of questions and I think this was a great conversation and um, we'll continue to have this uh, conversation at a town meeting. But in the interest of time, we need to move on to the uh, remaining articles, but thank you. Okay, next is transfer uh, to stabilization funds so that the town raise an appropriation and transfer it to, to two different funds, the so capital stabilization and the general stabilization. Um, those numbers are still uh, being worked out, but I will hand it over to Jennifer Hewitt who can uh, comment on this and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jennifer Hewitt, Assistant Town Administrator, Finance Director. Uh, um, we, in looking at the results from fiscal year 23, we identified a number of accounts that, re that took in more revenue than had otherwise been anticipated. Um, and that we've been using those revenue streams, the, those revenue um, actuals to forecast FY25. And uh, at the same time, we'd like to take this opportunity to restate FY24 revenues and then by increasing them and by a total of 1.45 million and then transfer the um, about half to the capital stabilization fund and half to the general stabilization fund. Um, the projections at this point are $725,500 for each um, to be discussed by the uh, select board on Monday night. Thank and, you. Uh, um, one of, if I could, um, one of the reasons that we, by identifying the, the, the funding now, um, we're then able to appropriate it and put it into the stabilization funds and then they're available for appropriation at the annual town meeting in the spring. Great, thank you. And would this be, is this the first uh, amount being put to capital station uh, stabilization or is, did we do that earlier? So um, the June town meeting established the capital stabilization fund or they it re, um, revised the capital stabilization fund um, and dedicated some funding um, to it. Uh, there has been a, a deposit already when we sold the Chenery modulars in August. Uh, there was a $35,000 um, cost for that, or you know, the, the town received $35,000, and that has been deposited into the Capital Stabilization Fund. Great. With that, with that any questions? DNA, isn't that nice after the last one? <laughs> Okay, we will move on. Uh, next is uh, a citizen's petition that I believe is going to be um, moved to a different date, a different town meeting date, not this fall town meeting, but um, it's citizen's petition to change the board of assessors from elected to hired, similar to what uh, the town voted on for treasurer, this is again from the Collins uh, Center report. And with that, I'll hand it over to Angus Abercrumpy, who's gonna make some comments on it and let you know what the plans are for the, this going forward. 
Yeah. And so I guess I'm, you should be able to turn on your video as well now. I might be able to. My camera's been finicky, so I might, if you don't mind, I'll I'll keep it off uh, and just talk to you all. Um, but essentially, yes, this will be, I will be moving to dismiss this petition uh, due to the longer than expected warrant for this town meeting. Uh, it's been decided that it is better to put this up at a virtual special town meeting in January. Uh, so you will see this again. You will see this again this year. And the hope is still to have it on the ballot for voters uh, at the next town election. Uh, essentially, uh, as Jeff said, this is very similar to the treasurer uh, ballot, ballot question that we had on the ballot this year in that we are moving an elected board to an appointed board. Um, and a lot of the motives are the same. The goal is to establish a more professional and uh, accountable system with a position that just doesn't face contested elections. We haven't had a contested race for a seat on the board since 2012. And when the threshold to get a seat on a board that really is responsible for making us able to have taxes, is get to 50 signatures and cross your fingers that no one else runs, uh, that can be worrying. Um, so we're gonna go a little bit into, we are gonna present this at town meeting and go a little bit more into depth on some of the concerns around uh, finding qualified assessors and um, ensuring that we have a cohesive finance team in town um, when we present this at town meeting, uh, but we will not be debating it or voting on it. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, since it's going to be dismissed and there's going to probably be forums and much more discussion around it, uh, we, uh, we won't take any questions on this and move to the next. Uh, uh, Jeff, can I just make a quick uh, sure. comment? Uh, Roy Epstein, chair of the select board. The, the select board at our last meeting did call a special town meeting in January. So this, this town meeting in January is for real. It's not just a concept. Okay. And I'm imagining there'll be informational sessions coming up. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next is to uh, Article 6 to amend the zoning bylaws. Uh, the, this is the uh, to change the bylaws when it comes to the procedures of uh, opening a restaurant. Um, with this, um, we're, we have a, a small presentation that uh, the Chair of Economic uh, Development Committee was going to uh, to uh, walk us through. And while we make sure him and others are on, I will bring up the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Lubian. Good evening, everybody. Just bear with me. Paul, is there anybody else you need that I might not have? Available. Um, yeah, I think we, we should promote um, Taylor Yates. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And then Chris Ryan is also on. Hey, Chris. So um, just uh, we're a little bit behind uh, Paul. So obviously you'll be presenting something similar to a town meeting, but this is just to give some information to see if there's any questions that come off, uh, come off the bat right, right from this this material. And you can do, go. We'll go through six and seven. Seven's right after this, and then we can uh, take questions on both. Appreciate that. Um, so again, my name is Paul Joy. I'm the chair of the Economic Development Committee. I'm joined by my, the senior planner Chris Ryan, and also the chair of the Vision um, Twenty One Implementation Committee, Mr. Taylor Gates. Um, and we're here to talk to you tonight a little bit about Article 6 and 7, just for informational purposes only. Next slide, please. We can skip this and go straight to slide number three. So basically, what it is we're discussing tonight was developed, number one, through both the Economic Development Committee and also the Vision 21 Implementation Committee. Um, we were assisted in our efforts by the BSC Group, who is a professional planning consultant that provided us with technical assistance with regard to the actual to the language of these proposals, um, as well as with um, details around the process, both before town meeting, through town meeting, 
and then after town meeting as it relates to the attorney general process. Um, and so we also went through a process with regard to the planning board where we presented um, both articles four, six and seven to them. Um, article six passed the planning board by a vote of four to one and article seven passed the planning board by a vote of five to zero. So what is article six? Next slide, please. Um, so number one, this is a, pr a pretty significant rewrite of the existing zoning bylaw that was created back in 1988, I believe. Um, what it is that we're seeking to do is, is number one, to change the definitions from um, catering service, restaurant, to restaurant fast food and restaurant takeout um, to, two other, to two more broad definitions, which include um, formula-based food service establishments and, um, and, and also a, uh, a restaurant and a, uh, and a catering based um, definition. Um, we've also added a number of different uh, use table regulations to simplify the process for opening a restaurant. And we've also, uh, we also propose that, um, yeah, that, that the restaurants and the catering services would basically go through a filter, which would be the for formula based food service establishment filter before they are determined whether or not they are, in fact, um, either non-formula based or formula based. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. I can I can kind of pause here. This is where it kind of gets into the, the technical weeds of, of it. Chris, if you want, if you mind it's kind of helping me out a little bit with regard to um, some of the new changes with regard to the, the definitions and the, uh, the new schedule of rules or rule regulations, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So, uh, so the section 1.4 um, amendments, uh, essentially they simplifies the set of definitions for the different subtypes of food service establishments, merging each into um, four, four into one simple category, food service establishment, which encompasses sit down restaurants, fast food, takeout, and catering services. Uh, it also creates a new category the, uh, as Paul said, the food service establishment formula base, which are for those establishments that meet the criteria as explained below in the pro proposed amendment to section six. And we'll get into that in a second. So uh, as Paul said, uh, the schedule of use regulations really uh, deletes those four uses that were listed in section 3.3 and establishes the, uh, the two new sections. Um, and uh, basically everything that is a, a a uh, food service establishment is uh, by right in all the uh, commercial districts, uh, including the general business district. And uh, also the formula-based businesses are now a special permit in all of those same districts. And then the amendment to uh, section six really creates a new subsection that explains what formula-based food service establishments are and provides a differentiation between the, uh, the local and independent food businesses and the standardized uh, which could be called chain food service businesses that have a consistent theme, logo, color scheme, et cetera. And really uh, the reasoning um, that the proponents uh, are, are bringing this forward is that standardized food service establishments could have uh, a negative impact on Belmont's economic diversity um, and history, unique character, and should have a higher bar of review. So essentially that's it. Taylor, do you have anything else before we jump to article seven? Yeah, I mean, I'll just add, um, I'll add, I'll add a couple of things. So number one, um, allowing restaurants by right reflects, uh, more closely reflects the reality of um, how restaurants are distributed across Belmont. Uh, when, during our research process, we discovered that restaurants are located in every single business district in Belmont already. So we're really just adjusting the bylaw to reflect um, to reflect Belmont as it is and Belmont as the voters like it. The uh, formula-based food service establishments, you know, part of, we felt that um, this can be a win from all different directions in that, um, you know, it allows the town to preserve its character, but it also lays out clear rules of the road for businesses that want to come to Belmont. So, you know, um, one, one example might be like Tate, a much beloved brand in the Boston area. We don't wanna say no to a Tate. So we have laid out, hey, Tate, if you're gonna to come to town, here's what you have to do to conform with our other town goals. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that. 
we have probably two more minutes and then we'll wrap it up and take all that, any and all of your questions. So we'll go to the slide number seven. This is article seven, um, talking a, a little bit about the, uh, the parking requirements. So what this article seeks to do, number one, is right now, if you open a restaurant within Belmont, you basically have to demonstrate that you are allowing for one parking space for every two seats within your particular restaurant. Um, and so this, this article would basically reduce that by 50%, um, and it would require a restaurant to show that there was one parking space for every four seats in that particular restaurant. Next slide, please. Um, you know, why do we come up with this given ratio? I think number one is we, we did a lot of benchmarking um, with regard to this process. Uh, we looked at Arlington, we looked at Watertown, Waltham, Lexington, Winchester, a wide number of different communities. And what it is that we saw um, as it relates to their ratios was that for the most part, they also had um, one, to, uh, one parking space for every four seats. Um, and so that's kind of the basic reason. And there, there was something else too that we found. There was a 2001 report from MIT. They did a study on the Trapello Corridor for Belmont and they also gave us the same recommendation um, of one parking space for four restaurants. So even though that was 20 years ago, we felt that it was a decent um, proposal to kind of make it simpler and easier for restaurants to be able to, to, to get through that particular requirement. Um, we have a couple more slides. It's more based on the private um, sector impact and then also on the public sector impact. Um, just, just generally speaking, the private sector impact, we believe, will be increased levels of business opportunity, um, higher levels of property value, more jobs. Um, to fit because of the fact that you're attempting to make it easier to fill empty storefronts. And then on the public sector side, we do feel that um, you know, having restaurants, it does increase the amount of revenue generation because of the excise tax. Um, it increases the planning and development opportunities, or it makes it easier for the planning and development departments to be able to process these applications. And there's a number of ancillary based impacts, including public services, school funding, community development that we identified as part of our overall process. Um, okay, that's our slides. Thank you so much. And we will be happy to take any and all questions from town meeting members. Great, thank you. Um, with that, Great. Our, um, our first question is from David Webster typed. Is this basically saying that a chain restaurant needs a special permit while a non-chain does not? Yes, um, you know, a restaurant that meets the criteria outlined in the article um, will need a special permit, um, whereas one that does not meet those criteria will not meet a special permit. And one of the criteria is uh, number of locations. So, you know, as written right now, it's uh, the threshold is 10 locations. And um, so, you know, that that generally means a chain restaurant. Yeah, one of, one of the things that we did also find in our research is that over the last seven or eight months, um, for the most part, 80% of new restaurants opened the greater Boston area, and that includes Hamami and Tate within Belmont, um, had fewer than 10 locations, the majority of which had one or two locations. So this isn't a requirement around ownership. If you're a large restaurant ownership group, you're more than welcome to open like an, an individual restaurant that is Belmont specific. Um, with, you know, at, under the, um, the non-formula based um, criteria. The next question is from Jean Mooney. Um, you can speak now. Yeah, hi, Jean Mooney, town meeting member, precinct six. I'm not sure where these types of services would have fallen under, under the bylaw, but um, example, if someone wants to um, run a catering business out of their home, they're, you know, want to provide some lasagnas to small, you know, home parties. Um, is that allowed as a home business um, that someone has to have? I'm not sure about how that works with inspection of that. My second question is how, uh, where do food, food trucks fall as a restaurant? Those are both the fat phenomenal questions. Um, for the catering service, um, we did include the catering service and under the, uh, the food service establishment definition. Um, so it's quite clear whether or not it, there's actually only two. But this, if, if this goes through, there would be only two. There would be, be either a restaurant or a catering service. But can um, I have a, my I, catering service in, right. in my out of my home? I guess when it says in yeah. the general zones, non you know general residential. So if if I'm no, you, Gene, you would not be able to. So we we limited this all to the business, the commercial districts. 
yeah. all commercial. So someone cannot yeah. do catering out of their house. Correct. And that that's actually the way it is right None now. Us, I just so, wanted to clarify that. Yeah, of course. That's a great question. Um, and regarding food trucks, we also actually Ara might have something more to say about that. So I'll hand it over to him. Well, catering out of a house would be a home occupation under the home occupation, which would mean that uh, it's always required by a special permit. And if the health department approves the location, the equipment and everything else for catering, then it's under a different category as the use, then that would be like an accessory use. It will not be a main, uh, the principal use, and that's totally not related to this restaurant. Uh, but it would, could be allowed, but someone actually could do that then through that angle. I just wanted to make sure that this wasn't prohibiting what you're describing, Ira. That is correct. There are some, uh, there are few in town uh, as of now, and uh, I don't know if they're continuing or not. That would, once we give them the uh, permit with the health department, uh, they have to renew their application. They have to renew their license every year. And uh, if they have discontinued, I'm not aware of it because uh, all we get involved with they are the ones that are newly applying. So yes, this restaurant, this definitions or this uh, change of bylaw will not affect any of those who are still wishing to have some catering from their homes or, uh, and that's by a special permit. It is not by right. And food trucks? Uh, that would be health department. We don't, I mean, food trucks are parked on town property. They're not in their residential uh, sort of like houses. That's uh, all by the health department. And I don't know the rules. I don't know about those, those rules. Thank you. And, and I've got, I can just add one thing. Um, so the bylaw changes that we're making are limited to the business districts in existing spaces. So this does not, anything that's outside the business districts or that involves new construction, we're not really changing anything related to that. It's just if a building exists, if a space exists, we are changing how it can be used. Thanks, Taylor. Sure thing. Next question is from um, Vince Stanton. Hi, uh, to a comment and a question. The a com my comment is that the 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 name formula restaurant, I have to say, is not something I've encountered before, and you know potentially uh, confusing. Not sure why you didn't use something like a, a chain restaurant that would have been um, more easily. Uh, a term more easily recognized by most, but my my question is: there's it seems a huge difference between let's say a Massachusetts-based, an Eastern Massachusetts-based restaurant with twelve locations, and um, McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's or KFC. Did you give any thought to? It, it, or, or, but it seems that, that they are in exactly the same bucket with respect to needing a special permit. Did you give any thought to making a, a, uh, an additional layer of distinction or giving that some discretion? Uh, I guess that would make the law more complicated, but it, 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 it does seem to be somewhat arbitrary that, that the 10 restaurant cutoff, maybe there are other elements of the definition that I'm not familiar with that give you more flexibility. I mean, I, I might defer to Chris on this, but. Both, the answer to both of those questions is um, industry standard. So yes, like formula-based food service establishment is not, it's not a colloquialism, but if you are a professional who deals with this all the time, that's the term that you use. And then with respect to 10, this actually has come up a couple of times. And the answer has been that's, that's generally the industry standard cut off between, you know, uh, a, a chain and not a chain, but Chris, you, you tell me if I've got that right. Yeah, you do. I think what we really tried to do is come up with a term that was uh, uh, generally acceptable in land use law. Um, the BSC group's uh, Russell Burke was the consultant on this, and he did a great deal of research looking at a number of towns, uh, particularly in Massachusetts, that have, uh, have gone this route and have had their bylaws uh, approved by the attorney general. 
Um, so Concord is, is one of those communities. And the formula-based uh, business uh, terminology is, is generally accepted in that realm. And uh, so what we try to do uh, is put something together that met the, the, the smell test, so to speak, of, uh, of, the, you know, of, the, of the case law. And so I think um, our town council has all, already also uh, made a couple of small adjustments, but uh, largely uh, it, it remained intact from uh, what was done by the BSC group. So uh, I think uh, everybody's pretty confident in its, uh, in its construction. Thank you. Um, Jeff, did you want to speak to Aaron Pixelingus's question now, or should we go on no, to the yeah, next I can address that, and actually, it'll let Roy and uh, uh, Angus um, know. Yes, there are some amendments to both six and seven, which we typically do not get ahead of this meeting. Uh, I do have them in here, but given the time, I would um, prefer to go through all the main articles. And if there's time left over, we can go back to the amendments. Um, clearly, those will be discussed at town meeting, and they've been circulated out to town meeting members. So um, it is here, but we'll see how we do in terms of time. Okay, um, we're, we can wrap this up pretty quickly on this one, it seems. Um, Lisa Pargoli just said, I want to thank Paul for all the hours and research you put into the multiple projects um, that you were involved with, great presentation. And Mary Lewis says, just to clarify, this is not adding new requirements for chains. Is that correct? It's making it easier for non-chains. So, so I, I can answer the second question. Um, it's not adding, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of one of those yes and no questions. So yes, there is, there is new requirements in that if you are a chain, you now have to get a special permit by virtue of being a chain. However, where it's a little bit easier is we lay out the rules of the road to get that special permit so that the process is less capricious, um, less driven by the ambiguity. So, you know, if you're willing to, if you want to come to Belmont and you're a chain and you want to play by the rules, like you are totally welcome, right? right. We can't, we can't deny a special permit just because we don't, you know, we don't like how McDonald's hamburgers taste or something like that. Thanks. I think we're done. Thing to, and the other thing to add, I, I would say, is that we we have we have equally restricted um, any and all drive-throughs, so they would not qualify under under the statute. Okay. Thank we're you. Done, Jeff. Other yep. than, than that question about amendments. So as I said, we're going to skip the amendments right now. If there's time, we'll come back. Um, so here is Article Seven Zoning Bylaws. And this is the uh, the parking the the parking requirements from restaurants that was reviewed in the presentation uh, a few minutes ago. Any questions on this article? Not yet, and it doesn't look like well, it doesn't seem like it. Okay. Uh, there are two amendments from Angus Don McCrombie, uh, Tommy Eman and Precinct 8. If there's time, we'll get back to those. But now I'd like to jump to the next article, which is uh, off cycle community preservation projects. Um, so there's three of them uh, one for additional funding for the community path, uh, funding for town hall uh, retaining wall, and then funding for uh roof uh necessary roof work on the school administration building we'll start off with the first one and uh i'll hand it over to uh town engineer glenn clancy uh thank you jeff uh, glenn clancy town engineer good evening everyone phase one of the belmont community path runs from brighton street to the clock street bridge the project includes both the path and a pedestrian underpass at alexander avenue the original estimated cost of construction for the pass uh, for the PAP and underpass was $14 million. Using the industry standard of, of design services being approximately 10% of construction, a design budget of $1.4 million was determined. Town meeting awarded $1.4 million of CPA funds for the project. So simultaneously, there was also an additional $150,000 awarded to the town through a Rails Trails grant. 
Uh, at the outset of the design process, the MBTA was adamant that tunnel jacking was required in order to install the pedestrian tunnel. This determination was made in March of 2020. For the next 20 months, Niche Engineering designed the underpass accordingly. In November of 2021, 25% design plans were submitted to MassDOT for review and approval. It was during this review process that the MBTA reversed course and decided cut and cover was the desired way to install the pedestrian tunnel. Unfortunately, it is left to the town to fund the new design effort. In addition to changes requested by the MBTA, other items were commented on during state review, which has prompted additional design effort. In total, the additional design work amounts to $476,925. There is a remaining balance of $141,057 from the original 1.4 million CPA funds, leaving a balance of $335,868, which is the request before town meeting this fall. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, we'll we'll take questions. We'll just we'll take it each each uh, on their own. So, qu any questions on this CPC uh, CPA appropriation? We have one so far. Um, Judith Feinlieb, you can speak. Hmm. Thank you, Judith Feinlieb, Town Meeting Member, Precinct Six. Glenn, do I understand correctly here that we? have to do this because the state has said we have to and we also have to come up with the money for it i'm sorry to be a little confused about it no that's quite all right judith that that is correct um you know this process includes uh, funding uh primarily through uh federal funds that the state controls um our obligation is to fund the design of the project. You know, one of the requirements in this process is that is that our design is is reviewed and approved by MassDOT. The MBTA is a is a major player in this particular project because of the proximity of the path right. to the active rail, uh, and so we are obligated to respond to their comments and uh, and do the redesign accordingly if we want to continue to pursue the construction funding. And presumably, I mean, we keep. What's got me a little confused is we keep being told that we aren't going to have to pay for this, and here we are paying for it. Yeah, I think, um, again, Judith, uh, Glenn Clancy, town engineer, um, I think when people have said that we are not paying for this, I think what is meant by that is we're not paying for the construction. Currently, the estimated cost of construction is uh, just north of $21 million. Um, so I thought I think what people were trying to convey was the was the fact that construction funding was not going to be on the town of Belmont, but it's always been understood that design funding is the responsibility of the town. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Sue Bass had a comment um, and I answered it live. Uh, so it took me a second to find it again. She, basically, this is good news. Cut and cover is not only cheaper immediately for the state and feds, but also faster. The small additional design costs are a comparative bargain. And that's how I think I would have, as a vice chair of the committee, described it. Um, but we just can't get anybody else to pay for the extra design. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Glenn. Now, Bonnie, I was going to say that uh, as the moderator this evening, you are uniquely positioned not only in that role, but uh, to answer questions on this particular item because uh, you are the vice chair of the committee. <laughs> yes, that's why I just answered Sue yes. um, with a message online. Um, but uh, oh, we do have another question now. I was going to say because there were no other questions. I thought we were done. Um, Angus Abercrombie, you can speak now. Yeah, I feel like I heard this in some select board meeting, and I want to verify it and potentially throw it out for consideration, that we were able to negotiate a slightly lower cost on this design work because of the circumstances. And so there has been considerable effort into getting this price tag down despite the increased cost. Uh, uh, so Angus, uh, Glenn Clancy, town engineer. So Angus, uh, at the select board meeting, it was uh, suggested by Chair Epstein that um, you know, there is a certain percentage that 
consultants add above and beyond the cost of subconsultants that are hired. Uh, it was speculated that that percentage may be as high as 25%. Um, I was asked at that meeting to go back to niche engineering and find out what that percentage increase is and to see whether or not there was an ability to negotiate that. In fact, the, the increase uh, that niche puts on these consulting engineers is 10%. They agreed to meet us halfway on that in, on that uh, premium they put on. So we got that number down to 5%. Thank you and congratulations. And Glenn, that ended up being just what, like 30 or 50,000? No, actually, I think it was closer to sixteen or seventeen thousand. Okay. Um, the, it turned out the markup on the sub consultants wasn't as great as we thought it was. Uh, as I said, we initially thinking around twenty five percent. In fact, it was only ten percent. Um, yeah. we'll hold off on that question because we need to get there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any others on this on A? No, it does not seem like it. Okay. So B is 160,000 appropriation uh, for town hall uh, retaining wall. Um, the director of facilities, Dave David Blazon, will uh, uh, speak more to this. And while he's doing that, I'll bring up some pictures, at least one picture, so people understand what we're talking about. Okay, which one are you bringing up first? Uh, the town hall. Okay, so the uh, town hall back in uh, uh, April, May, I'm sorry, March, April, uh, lost the uh, retaining wall to the driveway going up to the front of town hall. And uh, we've uh, determined that this is a significant failure that uh, the entire wall is um, uh, compromised and needs to be totally re-engineered, and uh, and uh, and so we've uh, solicited uh, one hundred sixty thousand uh, dollars from the uh, CPC to uh, hire an engineer to uh, uh, do a design study to repair this wall. And here we have the picture. That's showing the current situation. Any questions? It's um, you saw Paul Joy's question, I believe. Um, uh, should I? We'll we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So there are no other questions on that, but. Um, just for people who have driven by, is that why there's a big truck there and caution tape often? Actually, actually we're in the middle of uh, repairing the slate roof, which is another CPC um, uh, grant that we received uh, during the last uh, process, and uh, that's uh, nearing its completion. So um, we're just tying up some loose ends with some uh, punchless items, and that uh, lift will be out of there within the next couple of weeks, but that has no association with the uh, project of the retaining wall. Um, there is a question about the retaining wall now um, from um, Lisa Tadrias. Um, how does the retaining wall qualify for CPC? Is it a historic preservation? So the okay. building itself, it, it, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So, I mean, the, my short answer is yes, Town Hall is one of the oldest buildings in the town. And it's an historic uh, uh, asset to the town. Retaining wall uh, holds up the driveway that leads to the uh, south portico that leads into the main uh, auditorium and uh, first floor of the building. So it's very much a part of the uh, infrastructure uh, and access to uh, town hall. That's, that's the only question. OK. I'll bring back the main presentation. So here the next is 200,000 for the school administration roof building. So uh, we just recently uh, through the uh, historic district uh, uh, committee, we uh, hired a uh, company after a uh, solicitation of uh, 
proposals, um, and we selected a company, uh, the Spencer Preservation Group, to do a study on the three buildings in the complex, the school administration building, the Homer building, and town hall. Um, and um, to their review of all the buildings, there was one project that seemed to be uh, more urgent than the others, and that is a standing uh, leak around the school uh, department building uh, or the school administration building uh, that is uh, associated with the elevator shaft and the south um, chimney. There's some complicated angles and uh, and uh, tie-ins between the different uh, uh, structures that uh, have compromised the flashing uh, as where the arrow is that Jeff has right now, you'll see um, water leaks and damage within the stairwells that's next to the chimneys and the, uh, and the elevators. So it is the uh, recommendation and uh, proposed budget uh, to uh, engineer and repair these sections and make them all uniform. Currently we have slate, copper, um, poor, poor drainage, um, and uh, not properly flashed sections. Some of the brickwork is uh, fatigued and the joints are starting to show cracks and uh, water infiltration. So um, with the $200,000, we'll be able to engineer and re make repairs to the, to the section of the building and make it weather tight. Thank you. Questions? Um, I guess we'll go Paul's. Yes, let's start with Paul's. For the school, sorry, I should say it's Paul Joy. Um, from, for the school administration building roof restoration, will that be a slate roof similar to the town hall funded earlier under CPC? It will be a, uh, it will be a sectional, sectionary uh, re repair. Uh, it will be slate, it will be copper, it will be all the uh, uh, materials um, that are uh, significant to the original structure. Uh, it will also go through a full review by the HDC before anything can uh, can be uh, touched and replaced. And Sue Bass says the elevator is reasonably new. Why is it leaking? Uh, I wish I could tell you. Uh, it, as I said, it's a combination of um, of the structure of the elevator chase, the brickwork on the outside, and the chimney. I can't tell you why it failed, um, but it, it, it has shown signs of um, improper flashing um, cracks, as I said, in the uh, in the chimney, and um, and just the water is building up and not properly flowing out to these uh, areas. As you can see from some of the photos, it's sort of a right left right left uh, um, in order to get the water out and it doesn't smoothly uh, drain from the roof. So when you have snow snow events or side driven rains, uh, the water's just finding its way into the uh, areas. Thank you, that seems to be all the questions. Okay, thank you. We'll go back to the main presentation. So that's Article 2. And then Article 5 um, replaces uh, basically, this is changed the, the bylaws for the energy stretch code. This was discussed at uh, Springtown meeting. But it was decided to uh, hold off on this until the fall, and now we're here at the fall. Um, so it's, there's been a lot of discussion around this, and in the interest of time, uh, Ara, if you wanted to say a few things, and then we'll take any questions that might be out there. Yes, I mean, uh, my part is going to be more the technical part. So. Uh... I'll try to be as brief as I can, and then I'll take any questions. So currently, the Hearst rating of all new buildings is at 55 for all electric and 52 for mixed use energy, which is fossil fuel and electric. 
on fossil fuel. Beginning July 4, uh, July 1st of 2024, uh, the standard stretch energy code, it by itself will change. And the Hertz rating for the all electric will be at 45 instead of 55, that's currently now, and 42 to mixed use or mixed uh, fossil and electric uh, usages. And the air change per hour currently and then will remain at three air changes per hour. Now, if the town adopts the opt-in or the specialized stretch energy code, it, uh, <clears throat> it divides, or, okay, this will not affect any additions, remodeling, renovation, or uh, anything of all existing buildings. It only will apply to new structures, new buildings. And it divides into three categories, the three categories by size, which are buildings, which have a living area up to 4,000 square feet. The second category is 4,000 to 12,000 square feet. And the third one is anything more than 12,000 square feet of living area. And the difference between the requirements are slightly different from one to another. I'm just gonna go over my notes and sort of like, you know, just read them and sort of explain. So buildings up to 4,000 square feet, if they are all electric, the difference is gonna be that, you know, I mean, it's gonna be at first rating, it will remain at 45 and would require a solar panel system uh, capable of delivering four kilowatt power to that building. And this is if the building is all electric. If the building is up to 4,000 square feet with fossil fuel, first, they must achieve a Earth rating of 42, not 45. Requires a solar panel system capable of delivering four, uh, four kilowatt power must be pre-wired and ready for electric switch without additional work to make all electric building. Uh, this differs from the standard stretch code, which only necessitates basic provisions for future wiring. Sort of the basic standard uh, stretch code does not require a solar panel, does not require uh, an EV charger, but they require, it requires that let's say a penetration through the roof be already available or the electrical panel be at 400 watts and capable of uh, providing 50 watt of uh, power to the EV chargers in case a new owner chooses to have one. Now buildings between 4,000 square feet and 12,000 square feet either electric or mixed fuel, must install sufficient solar panel systems to power the entire building. So this could be more than four, uh, four kilowatts or whatever it takes. And for mixed fuel buildings, the Hertz rating now comes down to zero. From that 42, it comes down to zero. Now buildings with living area of 12,000 square feet or more the only option for these buildings is the passive house approach, which includes installing as many solar panels as the roof orientation will allow and the surrounding landscaping would permit, which is if there are tall trees or whatever, then they would take into consideration. And that's how they would decide on how many panels should be installed as for solar panels. They have to achieve 0 0.6 air changes per hour in contrast with the three air changes for the other buildings or the standard stretch code. And it has to incorporate a thermal break. I'm sorry, uh, that encapsulates the building from the bottom of the uh, slab in the basement or through the walls on the roof, all the way to the ridge. 
And the last piece is, it has to provide a certification for compliance for uh, being, you know, um, a net zero or passive house building. So this is the summary. Um, I'll do my best to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, any questions? There seems to be a hand raised, but I can't do you. Oh, that, now it's there. It wasn't showing up for me at first, um, which usually does in Zoom. Uh, Vince Stanton has the first question. Uh, yes. Roger Rubel, who uh, did the legwork to um, get this article on the warrant, wrote an article in the um, uh, August, September issue of the Belmont Citizens Forum newsletter explaining in detail the the rationale for uh, uh, switch upgrading to the specialized energy code, the, the history of how this, the state enabled this. It's an opt-in for mun municipalities and making the case for why uh, Belmont should opt into the specialized energy code. If you want to read the, the article, which is, you know, it, well, illustrated with the uh, figures and data supporting the argument for uh, this article. The title is Why Belmont Needs the Specialized Energy Code. If you just search Roger Rubel and Why Belmont Needs the Specialized Energy Code, you'll be able to find his article. Mr. Stanton, just to let you know that my position is not to advocate or any other kind. I'm just uh, trying to explain what the what I would be reviewing and enforcing if it's adopted. And uh, I have not read the article, uh, mainly, I mean, for a reason. And the reason was that I didn't want to get any uh, influence. I don't, I didn't want to be influenced on my presentation. And I tried to base my uh, presentation just to the points that I thought uh, you know, one is different from the other. Again, yeah, under, under, understood. I, I, I'm going to vote for this. So uh, okay. I'm just directing people to a, a place where they could find a cogent uh, okay. ar argument in, in support of it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeff, the other hands raised are Chris Doyle and Roger Rubel. Do we want to do you have a not, well, Yeah, we'll do these two. And then there's a, uh, folks, there's only one more article after this. So I know we're going over, but uh, to try to just close out, we'll, 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 I think if it's okay with you, Bonnie, just push through a little bit longer. Yeah. Yes, but I was just trying to ask if you had a preference, whether, since Roger is obviously, oh, yep. Roger. What's Rod, Roger, if he wants to uh, speak quickly. Um, again, this has been presented and discussed a lot at the last league meeting we had. So um, I think- yes. Not, not a lot has changed, but with that, Roger. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, rather than going into the details of this, so I, I have some um, issues with some of the details of the information that ARA presented. So I think the best way to handle it is for me to communicate directly with ARA so we get on the same page about this rather than discuss it here. It, it, the main difference is that if you build a uh, residence that is all electric, you don't have to do anything more than you'd have to do in the standard stretch code, the, the underlying stretch code. Um, and the same for a 400,000, I'm sorry, 4,000 square foot or greater home. If the home is all electric, you really don't, you don't have to do anything other than what's required um, in the standard stretch code, which is the current um, energy code. But I, I'll talk to uh, ARA about it all um, offline and we'll come to town meeting with uh, the correct information. Okay. Yeah, Chris, you want to um, ask yeah, a just, question? Do you have input um, on this? I, I, just, I just wanted to just comment from a process point of view. I think that this topic, um, based on what ARA presented, um, begs a chart, someone mentioned a chart on a different topic earlier, I think it would be 
at least for me, far easier to digest if there was some sort of a chart um, summarizing the materials. Yeah, we have presented the memo to uh, Mr. Lubian, but uh, we'll share it with the others. And if there are any questions before then, I'll be more than happy. I mean, I was just reading my notes, my memo, and uh, Chris Ryan, Christopher Ryan, our town planner, also has provided some memo of uh, some opinions on his part. And uh, we'll try to make that available online. We'll make sure that gets uh, distributed. And then I'd also say uh, maybe a little bit of a combination of, of what was shared before can be uh, recirculated as well. That was shared in uh, spring by Roger. Um, there are no more questions. Just a brief comment by Deanna Earl that she would like the chart as well. Okay. All righty. Uh, Next is citizen petition. And again, given the time and, uh, and uh, Max has joined and been waiting patiently, I, I want to be able to, for him to give a quick overview of his citizen's petition. Um, I don't think we're going to really have time to get into a lot of questions. So this is just more to get the information out there. If there's any um, significant question, um, we could ask it now, but then we'll, we'll probably need to push this to town meeting. With that, I'll oh. hand it over to Max. Is he promoted? He he just was promoted. Okay. So he will be able to turn on his video as well. All right. Thanks very much, Jeff. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, this uh, article would obligate the select board to ask our state legislat state legislators to file a home rule legislation, a home rule petition, or other legislation exempting the town of Belmont from Chapter 61B. So Chapter 61B is a state law. It's been on the books since 1971, uh, 79, and it obligates the town to give tax breaks to uh, private organizations, private nonprofit organizations with more than five acres of open space. The only entity in town that qualifies is the Belmont Country Club, and they get a tax break of about $400,000 per year as a result of the state law. That doesn't mean the town collects less than $400,000. Uh, $400,000 less every year, it means it collects that $400,000 from the rest of us. Um, so if this article passes, then the town would ask the state to change the law. So that way, um, Belmont Country Club pays fill freight. This article would not affect Habitat, the schools, the churches, anything like that, because all those organizations are tax exempt. They don't pay um, taxes, so they don't need a discount. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Any, we could do one or two questions if there's any right now. Amazingly, there are no hands raised. No. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I had big, to say that. <laughs> All right, we'll um, do these. We'll do these two. Yeah. Uh, the rest you'll have to. Well, we can address uh, at town meeting. Okay, so Judith finally town meeting member precinct six. You're saying. There's only one entity, if that's the right word, in town. Is that because of size or, you know, what, what are the qualifications? So to, so to qualify for this exemption, yeah. you need to be a nonprofit organization. You need to have more than five acres of space. So Thank that, you. that limits it right there. And then that space has to be dedicated to a recreational purpose. And, and one of those recreational purposes is golf. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, the next question is from Allison Link. Great, thank you so much, Allison Link, uh, Precinct 8 Town Meeting Member. I just actually wanted to thank Max so much for bringing this issue to my attention and many others' um, attention because I seriously wasn't even aware of it. I'm certainly very aware of the issues with pilot payments, um, payment in lieu of taxes, which has come up particularly recently with the Belmont Hill School um, issue of, of you know, cutting down woods and buying up properties so we're not getting the uh, tax, um, property taxes anymore from those properties. Um, but this was a whole new thing in terms of um, the whole idea of the open space. Um, it sounds like mainly related to um, uh, clubs with um, uh, golf courses, because that has a lot of open space. So I just really wanted to basically thank Max um, for making me aware of this issue. And I, I fully support um, this passing, it, even though I know that's not what we're discussing tonight to pass or not pass. But I just wanted to say thank you. Okay. 
All right. Well, thanks everyone for uh, sticking through this. Apologies went over, but as we can see, this is a, uh, a lot of a uh, lot of uh, meaty topics for this uh, coming town meeting. Um, again, reminders: we're going to uh, all in the high school. Uh, there is a virtual option, uh, November sixth, eighth, and thirteenth. I think we will probably go three nights. And then uh, what I also like to show in these is uh, when amendments are due. And you can see for the November 6th, the first ones are due November 1st at 4 p.m. And then you can see the subsequent meetings. Um, apologies that we were not able to get to the amendments, but that will, those will clearly be discussed at town meeting as we go through the process. And with that, thank you. And thanks for all those that joined to give overviews and answer questions. And, and I would like to just thank you, Jeff, for helping make this warrant briefing as informative as many have been and remind people that the League of Women Voters is holding a lunchtime discussion on civil service tomorrow at noon. And you can get the information either from your email that um, the town clerk sent out or on many different websites. Thanks much. Good night. Good night.